Welcome back, folks, to Swiftly Speaking, Episode 7. Today I have my friend, Sean Allen. He's a well-known speaker on around the circuit on YouTube and actually in London a few years ago as well. Got to meet him there, which is awesome. Um, he's recently launched some courses on learning iOS plus take-home tests. And today I've got stacks of questions for him about job interviews, take-home tests, learning iOS, and much, much more. As always, there are folks here attending live Good to see you, everybody. Um, you have a chance to ask Sean your questions. So go ahead and chat away in the chat window. I'll do my best to grill Sean and make sure he answers them. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this show, which is Revenue Cat. They make it super easy to add in-app purchases and subscriptions and receipt validation and all that hard work to your app for extremely low prices. It's like a $10,000 free monthly plan. It's amazing. Go check them out at revenuecat.com. Sean, how you doing, my man? Pretty good, Paul. How about yourself? Lockdown. We're all sick of lockdown <laughs> know, at this point, know. you know. I think we're escaping <laughs> in one week all being well, but at this point, uh, my kids really, really want to go outside. Yeah, I'm, the, the quarantine and lockdown is actually pretty conducive to my lifestyle, you know, making YouTube videos, <laughs> coding. So it hasn't been as bad for me, but even me, an introvert that prefers to stay inside, I'm starting to get that itch too. Like, let me, I, I need to go somewhere. I need to go do something. So uh, luckily here in Pennsylvania, it sounds like we are going to lift with some restrictions here soon. So hopefully the, uh, sanity can be restored a bit. Plus the anxiety though. I mean, it's, you're sort of checking the news quite a lot. You're wondering what's going on outside. It's not the regular level of working, right? Eh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm able to just through. kind of put up, put, put all that aside and be like, all right, just head down and work, you know? Nice. Well, listen, Sean, I've got so many questions for you today from me, but also hopefully from the listeners as well. And I want to start off with the, the real basic stuff. What uh, would you say today is the best way to learn iOS development? Uh, YouTube.com slash Sean Allen. <laughs> um, no, there, there's many different ways to learn iOS development, which I think is, is great. And the, the main thing I would tell people is to figure out how you learn first, mm. right? Some people like videos. Uh, some people prefer books, you mm. know, you you learn in various different ways. So first figure out your, your learning style. Second, uh, another good thing with the community is there's so many different teachers out there. So find teachers that you relate to or, or you resonate with that can kind of like get through to you, right? Because some people may love my teaching style. Some people may hate it. That's fine. There's plenty of other teachers, you know, Paul's got tons of books out there, you know, so find your learning style, find the teacher that resonates with you. And that may be a few teachers. Um, but I think finding those are, are, are very, very key. Mm. And after you learn the basics, which is a lot of that content out there, um, start building your own thing. Um, it, it's one thing to just follow tutorials and kind of paint by numbers and you, you kind of feel like you're, you're get, making progress. But once you have your own idea and you start kind of building that, you're not following a tutorial, you have to figure it out on your own. Mm. That's when you're learning like really skyrockets. It's true, yeah. I certainly th feel that when you have something you're caring about, and for you, that's like basketball, for example. Um, but for me, you know, personal interest in me is, is Latin and Greek stuff, like a thing I like in my spare time. Take that passion you have, the thing you really love, your hobby, and just put coding in there somehow. Make an app that totally scratches your itch, and you'll find there are 100,000, if not a million people out there with exactly the same itch and money to spend on your brilliant app idea. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. I'm putting that right into practice myself too with, with Swift UI. Because with Swift UI, I'm a beginner. It's a whole new way. It, you know, it's declarative. I've never done that before. So mm. like I'm an absolute beginner with Swift UI. So I am creating this app where it's a, a scheduling app for content creators, right? You know, scratching your own X. I, I have this pain point that I want to fix. And that's how I'm going to learn Swift UI. Just trying to build this new uh, idea. So I'm going to put that into practice myself. Well, you mentioned Swift UI. So at this point, I think everyone's a beginner. I mean, I, I've been doing it since June the was it third when it was announced. Um, no, hey, you're a machine. Yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> honestly, I, I barely do UI kit anymore. I, I do some, but it's extremely rare and it feels a little bit cumbersome in places. Um, but no one is as advanced as Swift UI at this point. We're all still figuring things out, you know, as much as we can, pushing all the corners and so forth. But if you were to learn today, or you start learning today, would you say I would choose Swift UI? or UIKit? I, I have two answers for you on this one. <laughs> They're bo <laughs> both answers here. So the old and wise Sean that has kind of been through that before um, would say UIKit, right? Because for many reasons, uh, a lot of people have already said, UIKit's not going anywhere. Like you're not gonna be able to avoid UIKit. So that's what like, you know, if I knew now what I know then Sean would say. Young and naive Sean that's just starting out, 
would say, no, 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 I'm, I'm doing Swift UI 100%. I want to go where Apple's going, not where they've been. Because that's the that was the attitude I took with Swift versus Objective-C. Like mm. I completely punted Objective-C, never touched it, went all in on Swift in 2015. Um, and it was like, okay, maybe the world will come to me. Luckily, I, for the most part, it did. <laughs> um, but uh, so that would be young and naive, Sean. But again, that's not what I would do now. If I had the, the wisdom that I do now, if you want to call it that, um, I would definitely learn uh, UI kit for sure. Because again, you're not going to be able to avoid it, especially if you're trying to get a job because there's how many million apps out there that are all built pretty much uh, in UI kit. Like they're just not going to go away overnight. It's certainly true that Swift UI is uh, the, the new contender on the block and however many million apps is built using UI kit or app kit or watch kit and similar. Swift UI is only a tiny percentage. I mean, it must be less than 1% even, even today. But I think what confuses folks is they think to themselves, I'm going to learn Swift. And that means in a month's time, I'll start building apps. And in practice, it isn't really like that, is it? But you think about if I, if I were to learn French, for example, or Spanish or uh, any other language in the world, I might say, okay, I'm going to spend the next year learning French. So what I, I think folks try and think about sometimes is not just where they are today, but where they'll be are when they finish their learning journey to a point where they can get a job. Obviously, we've had one dub dub last year. There's another dub dub in about a month as we talk today. Although we don't know, weirdly still, huh. anyway. Say, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly, who knows? <laughs> yeah, but dubbed up. Anyway, but that will bring in Swift UI 2.0, presumably, or who knows what. And if someone's learning today and they expect to finish around about November time, that seems realistic to get, you know, I know enough to get a good job. Presumably at that point, Swift UI would be more adopted. iOS 14 has shipped as GM. Apps now can support N minus one, so about 13 and 14. Swift UI can be supported everywhere. I think that's the case or, or not. Um, yeah, I mean, of course it's going to grow over time. Um, I just, I don't think it's going to be the majority, in my opinion, for a couple years, you know, you're going to see, maybe it's going to be 5% of apps and then 10%. And it, it will grow in, I, in my opinion, it will dominate over time. Like you said, it's not going to be there next year. I don't think it's going to be to that dominant point, even in two years, three years, but it will get there. And again, first of all, nobody can predict the future, right? We're all just guessing. So that's just my, my viewpoint on it and, and what I think. And my reason being is kind of looking at uh, a time scale a little bit, right? Because I compare it to when Objective-C, uh, you know, when Swift came out for Objective-C. The App Store, correct me if I'm wrong, 2009, 2010, when developers could start, you know, developing for it, um, your Objective-C. And then 2014, Swift comes out. So that's only like four or five years for uh, Objective-C to build its base in apps before we started switching over to Swift. Well, now UIKit has had about a decade to build that base of millions of apps, so I think, you know, Objective-C kind of, or Swift overtaking Objective-C took, what, two, three, four years? You know, you could argue that, I guess. Um, I think Swift UI is going to take a lot longer just because UIKit had a whole decade to build a base. And also, like, I think more apps were created in the latter years of that decade, right? If you compare the number of apps made per year, probably in like 2012, 2013, and I'm just guessing, by the way, I don't have this data, but I bet more apps are being made in 2017, 2018 than there were in 2013, 2014, right? So, so it's like a curve going up. So anyway, that's a long way of saying UI kit has a ridiculously <laughs> large base of, of apps in there. Um, and I think it'll take Swift UI a longer than Swift did to like start penetrating that. But at the end of the day, I do believe it will overtake. We've got a question here from Muaz Hassan who says, um, Sean Allen, should we give a shot to Objective-C today too with the presence of UIKit and Swift UI? What do you think? No. Uh, well, <laughs> let me... Let me uh, Let's move on, let me, no. <laughs> no. No, let me preface that. Well, let me, I'll preface, these are just all my opinions, right? But I just think there's only so many hours in the day, right? If you have 24 hours to dedicate to learning this stuff, sure, learn, learn everything. But in reality, you can only focus so many hours on this in... You got to kind of spend those hours wisely. Mm. And if you're going to talk about cost benefit or, or return on investment, the return on investment in your time into Swift and UI kit and Swift UI will be way more than Objective C, unless you plan on working for a large legacy app like the YouTube app or Facebook, right? Those are still a lot of Objective C. However, those are, you know, few and far between uh, day by day. Okay. Well, You've mentioned briefly what you think about how it'll, UI kit will eventually become overtaken by Swift UI. How long do you think that really will be the case? For, for new projects or new code, like wholly new components of existing apps, for new stuff, how long do you think it'll be until Swift UI really becomes the standard rather than UI kit? Yeah, for, for new stuff, I, I think that is sooner, um, of course. 
Uh, obviously, we're all kind of waiting with bated breath to see what kind of improvements uh, we get at WWDC here in a, in a month, allegedly. Um, and I think that will really, it's really hard for me to say that now, right? Ask me in a month and that that picture will be way clearer when we see what new stuff uh, Swift UI. Because if they announce some small incremental thing, like, uh, it's going to take a little bit. If they come out of the gate with some crazy big monumental features and changes, like, okay, now, now it's real. Um, but uh, to kind of put a, a date on it, if you will. I do think after Dub Dub this year, you will start to see new projects grow and grow. And then almost certainly by, call it Swift UI 3, who knows what they'll call it. But uh, that's when I think it'll turn the corner. Um, and I'm kind of basing that on how long it took Swift to turn the corner, right? We all know that the Swift 2 to Swift 3 horror stories. Once Swift 3 kind of, that started the stabilization. And I think a lot of people really started taking Swift more seriously after that, the great renaming of Swift 2 to Swift 3. Hmm. It always amazed me how quickly Apple developers do jump on new stuff from Apple. It is usually very, very fast. And obviously, there's, a, there's that drawback of, you know, we have to support iOS 13 and iOS 12, and for some companies, iOS 11 as well. So that, that holds them back. But people really, really want to push forward and use the new cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And from iOS 13, that was things like compositional collection view layouts. They were huge in UI kit, and they're wonderful things, or difficult data sources. You know, they're really powerful features, and folks are really desperate to get there and get there and get there. <laughs> yeah. And I think Swift UI is, is, is that. There's a sort of fear of missing out. People see everyone else going, oh, Swift UI is amazing. And they're like, no, I must write UI kit still. And they just feel <laughs> like they're being held back a little bit from where they yeah, want to yeah. be. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I hate the n minus one even. Like, I just want to be on n. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Get rid of the minus one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like seventy-five to eighty percent people jump up right away on the upgrade. Um, but no, I, I definitely agree with you. And I guess I have a question for you is because I'm just starting my Swift UI journey with this project, um, and I'm a little worried about a certain feature. Are you thinking right now again before you Swift UI two comes out, like? Is it worth it to go all in, even though you're like, I guess what I'm asking is, are the headaches that you're inevitably going to run into because it's new, nobody knows, nobody's like an expert yet, you're probably the closest thing to it. Um, like, is that headache worth it right now before Swift UI 2? In my experience, the bridges between Swift UI and UI kit are very strong. And mm -hmm. so as, as long as you can divide your work between Swift UI work and UI kit work, it works brilliantly. The actual pain points, the real problem areas become when you've got to use Swift UI and put UI Kit in there somewhere and directly into there, not linking like a different, you know, push to a new view controller. That's easy to do in, in Swift UI. It's when you want to say, huh, uh, my table view in Swift UI, a list, I want to adjust separators. You can't. And you can't inject UI Kit in there. It doesn't work like that. You can push to a new mm. UI Kit screen, you can embed a UI Kit UI view, um, but you can't just modify the underlying table. Sure. You can't monkey around with the navigation control, the navigation bar, because there isn't one there for Swift UI. It's just it's masked by the, the layer. That's the real pain points and that is what I expect them to fix in a month, two months when Swift UI two lands. Of course collection views, of course text views, all things are missing currently, but all those little linking points, we we cannot currently fix the problems like separation the separators in, in, in lists, for example. That's got to be top of the list, surely. Yeah, but that's encouraging, though, because, you know, like you said, as long as you separate your concerns, compartmentalize, you exactly. know, you'll have your little UI kit uh, compartments that, you know, when Swift UI is ready, it's very, you know, siloed off for you to just replace with, with Swift UI. So that's pretty encouraging. I think that's really how it worked with Objective-C as well. People would have existing view controllers or whatever model data in Objective-C, and they'd do the new stuff, separate stuff in Swift. They wouldn't necessarily try and extend the Objective-C uh, mm -hmm. in Swift, that would be uh, problematic and painful in places. They just say, okay, this new view controller, this new model, this new whatever it is, that'll be in Swift. And let them just sort of incrementally adopt Swift rather than trying to rewrite, because no one wants to rewrite. We've got, we've got brilliant UI kit code. We've got extremely talented UI kit developers out there. Years of maturity and testing and whatever works. No one wants to throw it away. New stuff, easy win. Mm -hmm. We've got a question here, and this might challenge you a little bit. Oh, um, Pra Prathamesh Kawaka asks, what would Objective-C have to do to make you give it a second chance in 2020? <laughs> I, I don't think it has it. Do? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, get rid of brackets. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, pay me a lot of money to work on an Objective-C project. <laughs> that's, that's not what somebody would have to do to do it. 
I don't know. I'm not like I, I don't want to make it come off as like me me bashing Objective C. Like uh, it's not that I hate it. It's just again back to the whole where do I want to spend my time and where am I going to get the maximum return out of my time? Yes. And I just think you know going forward, me taking the time to learn Objective C is not going to give me a lot of you know compounding benefit over the next few years. Yeah. There there's only so many hours in the day, and you get to choose what you learn that time. And what two thirds of that you're, you're building stuff. Remaining one third, you're learning stuff. How do you break down your time? But some sort of breakdown like that. And that learning, you might learn more about UIKit because there's thousands of APIs in UIKit I've never even touched and they're amazing and fun to play with. But you might say, huh, I fancy noodling around with CoreML today or Core Haptics today or you want to try something new because it's a fun language to work with. And then to say, yeah, I'll just carve this bit off and do some object to see. Eh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like I said, you'd have to you'd have to back up the money truck and dump it for me to, to do that, probably. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, when you think about folks who are learning Swift today, like they're, they're actively working on their Swift skills, their iOS skills, what would you say are the three most common mistakes people hit on that journey of learning Swift? Well, you touched on one a little bit earlier, and I think that is a unrealistic expectations. Like you mentioned earlier, some people think I'm going to learn this in a month. And, and they lack the patient and that just sets up their whole mentality like all wrong. Cause like you said, this is, you even mentioned like six months. I think that's the, the low end of how long it typically takes, you know, from, from the people I've seen in my community that have actually finished the journey, right? I've seen them from the start to them get hired. You know, it's anywhere from six months to two years. And I think not having that right mindset and expecting results in like two or three months just completely messes people up because when they don't hit it in two or three months, mm. then they get all discouraged, frustrated. Maybe they even quit. Um, so it's just having the right expectations up front and the right mindset, uh, I think it is one major mistake a lot of beginners make. Another one is like not willing to put in the repetitions. Like uh, what I mean by that is like it's just like practicing any other skill. Like you mentioned learning a language. Like you practice that over and over and over again. I think when people are learning you know, the, these things in, in Swift or iOS, like table views or the delegate pattern, you know, they watch one tutorial and they move on to the next topic or, you know, they just move on too quickly. Um, I, the, re, the, way, the reason you know table views very well is because you build a hundred of them. You know what I mean? They're not willing to just pound the fundamentals and like really learn it. Or if you're not understanding closures, you're not willing to spend three days learning nothing but closures, right? You, you move on to the next topic too soon. So, I don't think people put in enough repetitions, uh, my opinion, uh, from what I've seen. And then lastly is uh, what I, you know, people may be familiar with me talking about this, and that's the tutorial trap, where you just uh, do nothing but tutorials. And, and I'm not knocking tutorials, of course, that would be <laughs> not wise for me. Uh, but you can't spend uh, a year doing nothing but tutorials. Like I mentioned earlier, eventually you have to move on to building your own idea, building your own product. Of course, tutorials are great to get you started, spend a month or two there. Mm. But like I said, your learning really takes off when you start building your own idea and you're not following a paint by numbers recipe or tutorial. So get out of that tutorial trap. Uh, you know, don't stay there too long. So those are the three. Again, lack of patience, not willing to put in the repetitions, and then uh, staying in that tutorial trap way too long. Absolutely. Repetitions, I think, is so undervalued. People don't re recognize that things are very, very unnatural in programming. We weren't designed to type into a metal box and see numbers appear on the screen and make it work. That's not how our brain's wired to work. And repeating things again and again and again, 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, until it really becomes muscle memory is one of the most powerful ways of learning. I've, I've been doing maths with my 10-year-old recently, and we've been working on how you divide numbers by five. So I've been saying, you know, Sophie, what's 28 divided by five? And she'd try and figure that out. I said, no, what you do is, Sophie, you take 28, and you divide it by 10 to make 2.8, then double it to make 5.6, and that's 28 divided by five. So what is 33 divided by five? And she'd go, uh, I don't know. I'd say, well, no, it's 6.6 because .6, you do the same thing again and again and again. <laughs> but you've got to repeat the same formula again and again and again. Eventually it sinks in and becomes muscle memory. And it's just the same yeah. thing for programming. We're not special. We're not magic. We don't just get things the first try that people learning French or learning math or learning ice skating take years to learn with exactly the same problem, exactly the same solution, repetition. Yeah, I say that all the time. Everybody here listening or, or watching right now is good at something. I don't care if it's a video game or, or whatever. You're, you're good at something. Just think about how you got good at that. You, like you said, you did it for years, and programming is no different. Actually, in the Hour of Code, the original one, the uh, Code.org people, they had, and you'd hate me for this, 
a famous basketball player. I don't know who. <laughs> some, some guy, I don't know basketball, was saying that he wouldn't leave the court. He got, let me get this right, 10 free throws in a row. Something mm-hmm. like that. He was keep on that that's, a, that's a common thing in, in like, I remember that back in my high school practice days. Yeah. yeah. And, and that makes sense. Because what are you doing? You end up doing 100 free throws. <laughs> until you get 10 free throws in a row yeah. and that is the repetition and you know what you will nail free throws you know you- and the, the the thing maybe i don't know i'm trying to see if i can relate this to programming maybe you can but the reason you do that at the end of practice is because oftentimes the fourth quarter comes down to free throws so you want to get practice on your free throws when your legs are tired um so that's why you you do the whole <laughs> practice and then you got to make those free throws so you're used to shooting free throws with your legs tired I don't know if there's a programming corollary uh, to that, but I just thought I'd put that out there. <laughs> Come for the swift, folks. Stay for the amazing <laughs> insight into yeah. basketball <laughs> techniques. Um, so we've talked about how repetition matters. Let's talk about actual concepts. When someone is learning swift, what do you think are the most important concepts for them to focus on? Now, I'm going to go a little meta on this one. Um, because the, uh, you know, things like optionals, protocols, closures, like all that stuff is, is equally important. Like, I don't think you should learn necessarily one before the other. I'm sure there's uh, some of them that make more sense to learn before the other. But mm. I wouldn't worry too much about what order should I learn this stuff in. I would, uh, again, I'm going to go meta. Like, mm. I would worry about getting your, your mind right. Like, I, I talked about it earlier. Like, having the right mindset, the right attitude of like, this is going to be hard. Uh, this is going to take a while. I'm going to have to, like I said, learn closures over and over and over again. So uh, like just, again, having that mindset going into it with the right attitude, because like I mentioned, if you don't have the right attitude, you get frustrated, people quit. Like that's when you don't like programming. So again, don't worry about the specific concepts you should go into. Just worry about getting your mind right. Because I, I think that's I think that's what separates successful people to complete this journey versus people that quit and don't complete it is their attitude and their mindset. Right. Mindset is, is critical, as you say, because programming, when you make a mistake, it's never the computer's fault, or very rarely. I mean, at least. Yeah, yeah. Swift UI has a few think. bugs here and there, you know, <laughs> you might get something yeah. glitchy in places, but it's nearly always your fault or my fault. We've typed in true rather than false. We've, we've had an off by one error. And I, I, I saw Rob Napier tweeting about this a few months ago saying that the first step in debugging a problem is admitting there is a problem somewhere in your code. You've made a fundamental logic error in your code somewhere. Things you thought were true were not true, and you've made a mistake from there, and the bug is somewhere <laughs> backwards from there. How, how many times That's have hard. you said? How many times have you said that? Uh, oh, this can't. This can't be me, right? Something's got to be wrong with this code. This can't be me. I've said that so many times, and uh, I'm always wrong. <laughs> Well, Xcode particularly has gotten, uh, sometimes a, a quick restart makes core data work better, for example, um, which is a shame, but they're, you know, they're working on that. Um, but I think learning to say there is a logic error here and I've just got to break it down to small chunks, work backwards from there to find the problem and then nail it and move on. It, I mean, we all know when you finally do it, it feels great. Like, yeah, I beat the computer, whatever it is. But that process can often be 10, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, sometimes a day of pulling code to pieces and figuring out what's going on and you end up with, you know, print, I'm here, print, ah! <laughs> <laughs> you just, yeah. your, your brain's melting down. It's hard. And that's the hardest part of our job, I think. It's really, really, when it comes to the grind of fixing a hard bug, sticking with it, having the resilience to work through it, know it's in there somewhere, logic is in there somewhere, and, and getting it fixed over time is just, is just pure, pure willpower. Yeah, I, I do say that you have to uh, maybe not love the grind, but at least appreciate the grind, right? If every time you hit those roadblocks or that grind, you just crumple up into a ball and, you know, frustration and hate it, uh, you're going to have a rough career. <laughs> but if you, like, appreciate the grind and you know what's on the other end, uh, I think you're going to be good. Yeah. Um, the folks asking questions, I really appreciate them. But if you ask the same question multiple times, I will just put you in timeout. But you just flood the channel with the same thing again and again and again. So by all means, ask a question. Don't keep repeating it. I'm doing my best to see as many as I can. Uh, let's move on to another question here. Um, Swift is known as being a quickly evolving language. You've mentioned the jump from two to three. That was huge. But three to four was big as well. We suddenly have Codable to think about. 4.2 introduced a randomness API. Five gives us result. 5.1 gave us property wrappers, function builders, opaque result, return types, uh, single session returns, and so forth. 5.2 gives us even more stuff like the uh, key path function stuff. This is not a language that's going slowly. 
what advice do you have for someone to try and keep up with Swift and keep on top of all the new things in Swift? Well, my first disclaimer is that if you're just starting out and you're a beginner, like don't even worry about this stuff, right? Because it can be overwhelming, even to experienced developers, like trying to keep up with all the new changes. And even when you do keep up with them, like, you know, they're still months away from being released. So I guess I try to want to like put your mind at ease as a beginner, like this, you know, cutting edge Swift stuff, most likely isn't that important to you, again, as a beginner, somebody just trying to get started. So that'd be what I what I would say first is don't even worry about that right away. Um, however, if you are more experienced and you are interested and you want to kind of get into this world, I like to do podcasts uh, to, to hear about this stuff. And there's two good ones that usually focus uh, on this type of stuff. That is Swift Unwrapped by uh, JP Smart and Jesse Squires and then Swift Over Coffee with Paul and Erica. Uh, they dive into the Swift evolution process. And why I like the podcast is because, yes, you can go to the website, you can read the, the proposal, but a lot of that is very like high level programming. Like know, a lot of it goes over my head too. So what I like about the podcast is they break it down and talk about it. So you can, it just helps me understand it, right? When, when not only do you hear the proposal, but you hear the discussion around it. And sometimes like Swift Unwrapped, they would even have members of the, the Swift core team come on the show to describe certain features. And, and I love that because I like to hear like, you know, the reason why, like kind of like the right. conversations, like why these, you know, what else was considered that type of stuff. So anyway, my first answer podcast, uh, as you just heard Paul rattle off 30,000 features, I don't know how he did it, but Paul is always like living in the future. <laughs> like he's, he's on probably <laughs> Swift 5.6 now. Um, so he puts out a great, you know, what's new. He has a whole website dedicated to it. Right. Um, but you always put out a, a what's new in Swift five point, whatever. Um, so that's always a great, uh, go to, if you want like a, a, a quick summary, However, you want to get in the weeds and all that stuff, you can go to the swift.org forums. But that's, in my opinion, that's only if you're like really interested in how the language is constructed and you want to see the conversations real time when they're like discussing like, oh, we should add this feature, not have that. And here's why. If that interests you, you'll love the forums. But <laughs> my, my opinion, like I'm, <laughs> I would rather stick with kind of what's out there and, and perfecting that. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not really into living into the future. Like, I'll worry about that when it gets here. But if you are, that's how I would do it. I tend to ignore the forums entirely. Um, yeah. I find them argumentative in places. Um, really? Like, yeah, I was trying to read through the entire very, very long series of threads about the new proposal to do multiple trailing closures. And it gets to the point where folks are quoting from the Swift language guide at each other, like they're in the US Supreme <laughs> Court arguing about the constitutional <laughs> rights of something or other, right? That's it. Well, here in paragraph three, it says this. Well, your interpretation is wrong because of so-and-so. And it's like, what? And it only, it became quite funny because at one point, Dave Abrams stepped in and he said, when, when I wrote that, what I meant was, I'm like, okay, boom, this guy actually wrote the <laughs> yeah, thing, yeah. you know. Drop the hammer. He, he really did. He was quite funny, actually. Um, <laughs> but I can only, I can only imagine, like, you know how argumentative people can be over simple stuff, like storyboard versus code. Like, imagine that level of argumentative. Like, it's surprising anything ever gets done. Yes. I, I do live in the future, it's true. And I'm already looking at Swift 5.3 and wanting stuff from there because... <laughs> one of the proposals lets you remove self dot in places where it's unlikely to cause retain cycles and it makes swift ui so much nicer so mm -hmm. so much nicer and it'll make match um, ui kit code nicer as well but particularly swift ui is painful because so many closures in there for there are inside structs that they can't be a retain cycle there it's your inside a struct right mm -hmm. so self dot is safe but swift now recognize that and let you remove the self dot everywhere which is, which is which is really really nice cannot wait so is that that's pretty much a Swift UI change for the most part. Like it, it will affect UI kit, but do you think that the reason they're doing it is for Swift UI? Also combine. Combine okay. again has many, many closures going on. So anywhere where you rely on functions being used a lot and inline closures and so forth, uh, it becomes annoying having to do self dot, self dot, self dot. Swift UI combine. It's Apple framework still. It's Apple putting an Apple frameworks change, or at least someone putting a, a language change in for Apple's frameworks, but um, it will benefit greatly those two. Uh, but any, any struct you have, where you have to do self dot on a struct because you're inside a closure, just goes away. It just yeah. stops happening because that no longer is required as this change. But also Swift 5.3 has all the amazing Swift package manager changes. There's some massive improvements to Swift package manager in 5.3. So yeah, there's a <laughs> lots and lots going on. Yeah. Uh, and as I answer a couple of questions more from listeners about uh, learning stuff. Um, <laughs> Prathamesh Kawaka really wants a fight. <laughs> Do you even tabs versus spaces, oh. he says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
that's what I'm talking about. We, you know, programmers argue over that stuff. Imagine like serious implementation details. Like that's crazy. It really is. And it's the case that we're not here to argue about tabs and spaces. We're not even here to argue about MVC versus MVVM and My Little Pony and whatever else is the current cool <laughs> architecture. We're here to actually build and ship software to help people's lives get better. That's what we're here for, to argue about small things. Yeah, I think that gets forgotten a lot. <laughs> that like, you know, at the end of the day, yes, the architecture and stuff does matter, but not as much as it, as it does putting out a great product. Yes. Uh, we've got a question here from uh, Jia Yong Mok, who asks, do you recommend some free resources to learn Swift for beginners? I think you can. I can, because it's, it's not my stuff, so I'm going to recommend Paul's stuff. Paul's well, got well, all you, kinds you of... You have a master channel too, Sean. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, was, I guess I was thinking about my courses. Um, <laughs> not bad. That, my mind is all, got to make that money. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, there's a, yeah, my, the YouTube channel, it's pretty sporadic. So the, the reason I would recommend Paul's is because he has some, some structure around the free stuff, the 100 Days of Swift. There's a, a clear cut path, which is what a lot of beginners are, are actually looking for. Um, because there's so much beginner content out there that, that you can find, but a lot of it doesn't take you through a path. So, um, yeah, definitely check out my YouTube channel. Check out Paul's stuff. Uh, I recommend Ray Wonderlick. They do have a free section. Um, that's how, how I learned back in the day. Uh, there's a bunch of free stuff uh, out there. Um, yeah, that's what I would recommend. A uh, question here, or a statement really, from Notorious Garage or Garage. Um, learning writing clean code that's testable is where I lose my confidence. Now, I know you've had a rocky journey with testing previously where are you with testing now right writing tests for your code I'm, I'm like looking at it like through the window like it's right there like i'm reaching for it like we're still not fully involved in testing yet but we're we're, we're getting closer um it, let me just say this is kind of like a more, more more meta thing about the learning is like learning evolves over time like i think a lot of beginners can try to put too much on their plate right away like so i'm five years in my career and haven't even really tackled testing i'm not saying that's the right thing to do by any means but i'm not I don't think I'm a horrible programmer because I haven't tackled testing. It's absolutely a skill that I need to tackle. I know it's a hole in my game. I recognize that. But I think I think forgiving yourself and letting yourself learn over time and evolve uh, as a programmer mm. is, is the way to go, in my opinion. Um, so if you're uncomfortable, you're getting a uh, lack of confidence routing clean, testable code, um, just work on it. Again, like I mentioned the closure example, if that's if that's your your pain point, your your self-conscious about that, like that, you know, weighs on your confidence. Focus on that for the next two weeks. Re read some read some books, do some tutorials, uh, put it into a practice project. Just I like to fill the holes anywhere that I feel like I'm weak, and and I feel like now's the time to fill that hole. Just do nothing but that for the next you know x amount of time. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and park learning Swift and move on to our next topic, which is take home tests. When you applied for a job at a, a Fang company or similar, and they said, okay, we, we're thinking about you for the job. We want to make sure you can write good structured code. Uh, so they give you a take home test, a test you can take home with you. What kinds of take home tests are most common for iOS Swift jobs? Yeah, so they, I mean, they obviously vary a little bit from company to company because, you know, if you're dealing with a heavy map kit location company, of course their take home project might have some map kit stuff in it. So think about that with whatever company you're, you're applying to that you're probably gonna get something uh, along those lines. But Really, at the end of the day, like if you can hit an API, parse the JSON, you know, make the model and have it appear pretty on the screen in a table view or a collection view, you're 90% of the way there for these take-home projects. That is uh, what most of them will will do. Mm. Um, just some examples of some I've done in the past is I've had to recreate Giphy. Uh, if you've ever gone to the the Giphy app, how it's like a a Pinterest style collection view, right? You know the not all even clean lines, right? They're kind of like jagged, uh, and then animated GIFs playing. So I had to do that. Also in a performant way, so the GIFs could be playing with smooth scrolling. Um, I've done one that had to get a list of GitHub followers, which you know my course is all about, you know, kind of a GitHub follower app. Uh, so that take home test inspired that course. Um, really, the only thing similar is just that you have to get a list of followers. Everything else is different. I didn't, I didn't just rip it off. Um, but back to the example of like doing uh, what uh, an app does, I had to do like a mini version of DoorDash, uh, the, the food delivery service, right? Where I had to have the user enter an address uh, on MapKit where they could like pan the map, you know, drop a pin and that's where they want their food delivered. And then I had to find like a, uh, a list of restaurants, you know, based on that location, that latitude and longitude. So um, again, that just gives an example of something similar to the company you're applying for. So it's not like there's just one blanket answer. Aside from the, 
hit an API, parse the JSON, make it look pretty on the screen. Uh, that is pretty much in all of them. But after that, you're going to get some variance based on the company. It's certainly true that understanding JSON slash codable and good table view knowledge slash navigation view knowledge is a large part of our job, right? I mean, making mm -hmm. good table view, making good navigation, making good network data, that is what, a third of the apps out there, just like right there. That's it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you nail those skills, then hopefully the rest of it's gravy more or less on top. Yeah, I did have one that required programmatic UI, which was a funny story because at the time I had never done programmatic UI. <laughs> so like this, this is the first time I was like, I got the, I read the requirements and I was like, oh crap. I was like, all right, I guess we're gonna learn this. Um, but I was honest with them up front. Like when I submitted the project, I was like, I had never done programmatic UI. So I guess keep that in mind when you get this, you're getting my first attempt at it. And that actually went a long way because they're like, wow, this is pretty impressive. It was bad, by the way. It was, I mean, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't great programmatic UI. But they were like, wow, for your first time, that, that was pretty good. So I think being honest and upfront about that kind of helped out in the long run. Question here from Austin Conlon, who says, uh, which interviews pushed you the most? <laughs> Depends on where you want to be, be pushed. So my uh, my Google slash YouTube interview, the, the final interview, uh, pushed me to not go to a big company. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I'm not, I don't want to get bashing, so I'll keep this like very, very short. Um, it was not a great experience, but I don't, I don't put that as a knock on Google and YouTube. I think it was just a weird circumstance of events where my recruiter that was guiding me through the process, like a week before my interview and like when it's like really crunch time, you know, I'm trying to get a hold of them. I can't get a hold of them. And then all of a sudden they say, yeah, he's no longer with the company. <laughs> so like the last week leading up to my interview, I'm like in no man's land. When I get there, nobody really knows what's going on because he was the one coordinating it. And it, it was just because of all that, it was a horrible experience. And ironically, that's what pushed me to be like, you know what, do I even want to work at these big companies and actually push me to like, that was like the final straw to go like independent and like do my own thing. Mm. I don't think that's what you're asking for push, but I thought that was a fun story. <laughs> so I told it. <laughs> do you think when it comes to, so you've you mentioned code, we got that, you know, go ahead and do your product code. How important do you think are the non code things in a take home project? And I'm speaking things like testing, I'm thinking things like commenting your code or writing documentation around the code, everything that's not directly code, how important is that in a take-home test? Yeah, so think about this with take-home tests. Um, you're in a competition, right? You're, you're competing for the spot. I know a lot of people like to, you know, kumbaya, we're on the same team, but at the end of the day, when you're, when you're going for that job, like, you're competing. So I've never done any testing for my take-home projects, and I've always passed them. However, I would not recommend that. Um, I would do as much as you can possibly do. Right. If that's adding tests, cool. If that's adding documentation, even better. All you're doing is just making yourself stand out even more. That can backfire. Let me put out this, that disclaimer, because oftentimes uh, when you get these take home tests, they'll say, hey, please only take two to four hours on this or three to five hours on this. And if it's clear you spent a week on this thing, um, they may not they may not know how to judge your project. Right. Because they were looking to see what you could do in that kind of short amount of time. Um, so there's a balance there of, you know, putting in all the extra credit versus not going too far with that. But to answer your question bluntly, the more you can put in there to, to demonstrate your ability, in my opinion, uh, the better. So recently, um, Matt Rickardson from the SwiftUI team tweeted out that they're hiring someone for SwiftUI right now at Apple, which, of course, you're writing Swift all the time, which is nice at Apple, mm -hmm. working the cutting edge of Apple's frameworks, which is awesome. And they, he made it clear in his tweet our test is a GitHub based take home test. And I would so love to see that test. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't so apply for the job. <laughs> I can't move to Cupertino. I've got family here in the UK, um, sadly. But um, not, not sadly, family, sadly moving. <laughs> um, and I'd love to see a test so badly. And um, I actually tweeted back saying, you know, I hope tests form part of it. And Kyle Maycomer, also ex Swift UI, said, yes, they do. Um, so Apple clearly have, you know, write some code in Swift UI, but also write tests and something else around it. I don't know how long it takes, though. Is it, do you get a week? Do you get f three hours? I mean, three hours for a take home test. That's, that's fast, right? Yeah, that's not not long at all. I, in my take home uh, course, I, I talk about that as like you're typically only going to get three to five hours. However, in this course, you know, we're going to spend a long time on this because, you know, it's educational. I want you to, to see everything. Um, but what I would recommend with this with this small time period, if you can't, you know, you just don't have the time to do stuff. 
definitely make a note either in the comments or maybe make a, a paragraph in your email saying, if I had more time, I would have done this. I would have properly handled all the errors. Right. If I had more time, I would have implemented this, this, and this test, right. right? So even if you can't do it, tell them what you would have done. Right. Like, I think that's a key thing too. That, folks, bears repeating. If you run out of time, just tell them what you would have done. That's a killer point there from Sean because you will run out of time. You can't do everything. It's not a one month long take home test. We've got actual lives right. to leave here. When you run out of time, just tell them where you would go next. And maybe that's writing tests. Maybe it's refactoring your table view delegate. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's portion design. Tell them where you would have gone. So it shows you have the forethought thinking, the foresight to plan ahead and that you knew time restrictions were, were critical because that's also the case in, in production. If you have a year to make a great app, awesome. Often you have three months. <laughs> and then you'll say, <laughs> okay, it, what do I cut back here to make my thing ship? And what I would have done to do further was, was this. And you're also setting yourself up because the usually the next part of the take-home project is like, cool, you submitted it, now let's talk about it. So when you like mention that this is what I would have done in the future, on the second phase of that interview, now you know what the conversation is gonna be like pretty much, because they're gonna be like, oh, you would have done this test? Tell me how you would have done that. Or you would have refactored this way? Let's talk about that. Why Why this way and not that way? Because there's always a conversation about your project afterwards. So be prepared for that too. There's a question here from Franklin Bayuranga who asks, uh, Indie contract jobs, uh, what's your view on where a new iOS developer should start their career? For contract jobs, I would, for at the very start of your career, because it's very, very hard to get good projects as your first job as a contractor. First, I usually recommend working for a company for a year or so to kind of build your base, your foundation, because oftentimes when you're contracting, you're in control of the whole project. And as a brand new developer, that may be, you may be biting off more than you can chew. Um, so that would be my first recommendation. But if you absolutely must, um, I would start doing work and I don't normally recommend Upwork, but I'm going to recommend it in this case or, or sites like that. Um, because in my mind, in this case, you're more doing this for the experience, not the money, or at least you should be right. Because you're just going to struggle to get good paying contracts if you have no experience. So you should be looking at this like, cool, the money's great, but I want this for my portfolio. I want this to learn to build my foundation. So in the future I can get proper paying contracts like i said if you come out of the gate no experience expecting well-paid contracts uh you're gonna have a bad time right so i mean i don't want to sound cruel towards upwork but it sounds like you're gonna get uh easier jobs or smaller less mission critical jobs let's put it that way where you can write your beginner code your rougher code and get the experience doing contract work on 20 different frameworks 20 different projects often from scratch and then when you really have you know, your teeth cut, as it were, you can move on to bigger stuff. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. But what you're also going to learn from from Upwork, and again, I'm not trying to bash it, but you're probably not going to get the best clients because half the battle on these contracts are is, I'm sorry, like working with good clients, like having a bad client that doesn't understand software development, has crazy unrealistic expectations, doesn't want to pay you. You're you're kind of learning trial by fire. You're, you're learning all these horrible experiences. You're getting that out of the way and it's going to suck the first year or two. But that foundation of like those horrible experiences and learning from those and, and learning how to deal with that is just going to pay dividends in the future. So I don't know. I, I just think you kind of have to, to, to go through the bad stuff in the beginning of your career to, to really pay off uh, towards the end. Okay, we've got a question here from Raj Raval. I think I know you answered this one already, Sean. How do you decide which framework or implementation will be better to use and implement in a take-home project? Um, well, if it's not part of the requirements, because sometimes they'll tell you exactly what to build, so obviously that probably doesn't apply to this question, but if you have the freedom to pick and choose like however you want to build it, um, I, don't, I mean, it's a stupid, it depends answer. I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't, maybe you can elaborate on the question. I'm happy to answer it again. Uh, but I don't know if there's enough there for me to, to give a good answer. I'm like, which framework to use? Like, that really depends on what the project is. Or right. can you elaborate? But, but are you thinking more that there are a handful you'd reach for instinctively? Or you'd actually, you know, actually, I'd, I could build that from scratch, build that from scratch, build that from scratch. Are you, are you happy to use frameworks at all in take home interviews? Or would you think, no, 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 I want to build this thing entirely from scratch? Okay. Okay. So when you say frameworks, I guess I was thinking like, you know, the, the Apple first party frameworks, but you're talking about just third party libraries in general. Okay. Let right? me ask a question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if you're giving me a take home test and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I've got a week to implement Giphy, for example, 
yeah. would you instinctively reach for third party libraries of frameworks or do you make it yourself as much as you can are there a handful you reach for always or for you as always not invented here do it all myself yeah i would initially my first go would be to try to do it myself um excuse me because I think that uh, that shows when you when you turn in your project that uh, to me it just shows a better understanding. I've I've received take home projects as part of the hiring process for Aluna when we hired, and I had one project that it was a small simple take home project, and there was like ten third party libraries in there, and I'm like, did you do anything? You know, it was like a, a library for everything, and I was like, that's not a good look, right? Because you're you're kind of wondering, um, like you know what what can they actually build? But uh, so yeah, I try to build everything all native. Now of course that may not be realistic. Uh, an example I, I usually go to is, you know, if you have a good chart in your, uh, you know, your app, um, there's a great library out there called charts. I, I tend to, to use that because creating your own dynamic like chart from scratch, uh, that, that's a tall task. Mm. So, but things like networking, um, I used to reach for Alamo Fire instinctively. I've kind of over the past two years or so gotten off that because it's very, very heavy if all you're doing is basic get post, you know what I mean? If you're not doing like multi-form uploads and all kinds of crazy stuff, I feel like it's a it's very bloated for just simple stuff. So, yeah. Anyway, long answer. I tend to do it myself if I can. Okay. So when it comes to really doing a good job on a take-home test, what are your uh, your top three tips for really acing it? So my my first tip is superficial, right? I think you have to have a great-looking, clean UI. Because, uh, again, I, I don't know, my, I tend to lean towards in just general programming terms, again, creating a great product. Like, that's kind of like my number one priority. And, I, you know, the sad thing is people do judge a book by its cover. So if you have an amazing looking UI from the start, in my opinion, that's your first impression. So you're automatically starting like up here. And if your code sucks, then you just slowly like fall down. But you started up here. Whereas if your project is ugly, you're starting down here. And now your your great code has to dig you out of a hole. Right. So that's why I like to focus on the UI to, to start off pretty high with that first impression. And then hopefully, you know, the code backs it up and goes even higher. Um, so that's my UI thing. Another one is I'm surprised I even have to say this, but I do based on experience is take the time to proofread your code. Right. Just like if you were turning in a book report report, you're not going to just scrap it together and turn in your rough draft. Right. Go through. Make sure your spacing is constant, your indents clean up comments and print statements, right? I, I've seen, I've seen take home tests get turned in that literally had like full functions, like commented out and like just code was just so messy. And the reason why I like code cleanliness and readability is because remember, you're most likely applying to be on a team. And when you're on a team, your code readability and ease of understanding is in my opinion, just as important as the functionality of the code, right? Because other people have to work within your code and, and deal with your code. So that's very, very important. Um, and then the last tip, uh, we kind of touched on this before, but that's the handle, the edge cases and the errors, right? Like if you're just have a simple email form, you know, can your email handle all kinds of random emojis and characters, right? Like just, it, it shows that you're taking the time, like, like you mentioned earlier, Paul, you have the foresight to, to think about this stuff because Honestly, like thinking about edge cases and handling errors, that's where most of the, the, the hard work of programming comes in, right? Building the happy path, as they call it, that's the easy part. <laughs> handling all the crazy edge cases, that, that's where it gets tricky. So if you can show that you're thinking about that stuff, you can handle that stuff, uh, I think that goes a long way. I certainly agree. I, I think in Swift UI, Apple's managed to make the perfect WWDC framework. You can go on stage and it just looks brilliant out of the box. Like, wow, amazing, easy, easy, easy. And when we start using it in practice, you realize those edge cases kick in extremely hard and extremely quickly right now. It'll get better in Swift UI too, hopefully. But right now, there's a whole bunch of edge cases that does not handle very well at all. <laughs> and as a result, that kind of thing is a hard thing to do in a, in a, in a uh, take-home test because you want to build something that is robust. I'd, I'd rather ship a simple app that was, you know, covered the errors across the board, had great accessibility everywhere, had dynamic type or whatever, had a really nice testing and commenting, rather than go whiz bang pop, super cool, and have edge cases all over the all over the place I haven't bothered covering. Yeah, and, and back to kind of reiterate the point we talked about earlier, if you can't get to all the edge cases, that's another great thing to throw into that paragraph of like, this. these are the edge cases I would have handled. And that at least shows that like you thought of all these edge cases, you know, whatever they may be. Even if you didn't take the time to actually implement the fix for them, you at least took the time to think about them. Yes. We've got a question here from my friend Rob Whitaker, who, by the way, has a book coming out soon on accessibility in mobile apps. 
Check him out on Twitter for more on that. Uh, his question is this. Uh, what recommendations would you give to groups creating a good take-home project to bring out the best of candidates? So this is the other side now. If you're suggesting mm -hmm. to one who's making a test to give hope home, what would you recommend to them? Yeah, so this was uh, this is not easy. That's my first thing to say, right? Yeah, because I had to create the take-home test to give uh, for hiring out of Luna, and because you have to you have to again have this balance of finding out the stuff you want to know on like how they code, mm. but also being respectful respectful of the candidate's time, right? Because you can easily <laughs> come up with this project that's going to take 20 hours to do, mm. right? So it's a fine fine balance. Um, so let me let me think back to some of the stuff I made sure I wanted to check uh, in a Luna. Um, aside from like the basic, again, it was the hidden network, you know, parse the JSON, make it look pretty in a collection view. But I made it so uh, two of the views were very very similar um, to the view controllers, I should say. So uh, they had to get like uh, the top ten, and then like what's coming soon. It was like a movie app, so you had the top ten movies in theaters now, and then like the coming soon. Presented, they they looked the same presented, but they were just different data. So. I did that on purpose to see if they would reuse the view controller, right? Rather than like just making two separate view controllers and copying and pasting the code. Mm. Um, so I kind of put that uh, reuse, that was my reusability test, uh, if you will. And what I did though, uh, is sometimes in a take home test, you'll get a specific UI design spec that you have to build to. And I think that's valuable too, because you do want to know uh, if your developer can build the spec, right? Because I've seen people get a design spec and it looks like nothing like the design. You're like, wait a minute, like you need to be like pixel perfect here. Like that's the whole point of this. So there is value in testing for that. On my take home test, and you need to cater this to your company, right? If your company has a designer that that's what they're going to have to do, I recommend that. What we were design or hiring for is, you know, as a small startup, you need to have autonomy. You need to be able to contribute the design to this product. So when I gave the take home test, I didn't give them any UI. I just gave a small list of requirements and said, create a product. And I, and I was very specific to say, part of this test is to see how well you create products because that's important to us as a small startup. Like you need to be a product person, not just a type in code person. Um, so uh, I guess the, uh, the advice there would be to cater it towards what you actually need for the job. Mm. Don't, just, don't just have a blanket, I wanna see your coding abilities, right? If you need product ability, design ability, put that in your, your project. Yeah. I remember the very first take home project I designed for someone else to take, which was, I think it ended up six, seven, eight folks did it. it was iPhone, iOS four, maybe, maybe, maybe iOS five just, uh, and it was a simple project. There was like a, a list of picture names and to show them in a table view, the navigation right at the top and then tap on one to show the picture full screen and then, uh, share it somehow i think that's probably much it that was the entire project it was really really simple and it was the goal that everyone would complete the project it wasn't hard enough that you know people get stuck probably through but they'd, they'd come back to us and say here's my code and the value then was discussing how did you solve it why did you choose that what happened here and what happened here and so the, the discussion came out from that why did you choose this class hierarchy why did you build this model and that was the interesting bit not the specifics of it was a great to see at the time. <laughs> Why did you choose this object to see feature or this UI kit feature? It was more about architectural discussion and testing and similar. That was the, the real discussion. Because that's where, for me, as, an, as a hiring person, that's where the value lies. How can I get this interview into discussion space where you can have an open chat about mm -hmm. how you feel about MVC or what you think about coordinator pattern or singletons or I don't care what. Yep. Something opinion-based. We can have a discussion, not just like, how do the specifics of, of Objective C or Swift work? Because that's a bit less interesting to me. Yeah, I 100% agree. The, the the values in the discussion, how we use the the project was almost like a screener, right? So I think I gave like 10 projects and only like five of them made it to the discussion part. But the the project was a good way to screen out people that you know you may not even want to talk to. But you're right, all the value comes in in the discussion. And that's where we really found out like you know what the type of programmer we wanted so but to put a pin in this like to reiterate what you just said and i forgot to mention is i like to to make the candidate make choices like you said because that's the interesting part why did you make this choice and it's not that they have to like defend their choice but you hear their thought process on like you know what what they thought about that led them to that choice and i think that's where all the value is like you said yes okay let's park take home tests and move to a third part of this uh, chat here about interviewing for jobs so you've done your test, they liked it, you've been brought into the office, presumably for a full eight hour grilling by five different teams, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's interview time. Uh, what would you say is the best way to prepare for an iOS slash Swift job interview? 
Yeah. So, I mean, confidence is the big thing here. Um, I guess I can recommend this by like saying like what, what not to do. Um, I know oftentimes, uh, when people are studying and, and you know, I've, I have a lot of videos out there talking about very common, like, uh, iOS questions in job interviews and, and I did this too. So this is from personal experience. I would read articles, read blog posts, watch videos, and I would just regurgitate the talking points like, Oh, explain to me, uh, the delegate protocol, the, the uh, communication pattern. I'm like, oh, that's a one to one. Okay, notifications observers, one to many. I'm just spitting out buzzwords that I've heard from these articles without really like, you know, I mean, you kind of understand them, but uh, the best way is like, yes, learn them like that, but actually get uh, practical, practical practice. Is that a thing? Uh, <laughs> practice with them, like build small features, build small projects. Uh, one thing I think people get caught up in is when they try to build these practice apps is I think they need to, or they think it has to be this big, nice app. Like you can literally practice building one screen, you know, take one screen from an app or something like that and make it really, really small, uh, build something you can do in a day or two. Um, but focus on, you know, the delegate pattern or, or closures or, or something you're struggling with because having that practice with actually building it, these questions will be a breeze. You don't even have to think about them, right? When I was just kind of studying the the talking points, I was trying to memorize what I would say when they asked me about optionals, right? But if you actually have used these tons of times, you don't have to memorize anything, like you know it. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't treat it like you would study for a school test, like back in the day, reading books, taking notes right. and memorizing, like actually use it. That's gonna go a long way. Okay, got a question here from Sunny Patel who asks, hi Paul and Sean, how to prep for data structure and algorithms questions for iOS interviews? And what could be some best resources or resources to start with? So how do you prep for a data structure or algorithms question in an interview? You're asking the wrong person. Um, I suck at these. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I mean, how I prepped or, I'm gonna tell you how I prepped and I'm gonna tell you not to do that is what, what the moral of the story is gonna be. So I, I don't know, like, academics have always come easy to me. So kind of like what I was saying is like, if I had to study for a test, I would always study the night before and, and do fine, right? That led to bad habits in this programming career because programming does not work that way. Um, so what I would do is for data structures and algorithms, I would read cracking the coding interview. I might do one problem each of the, you know, the breadth first search, depth first search or link list. I would do like one or two problems and be like, all right, I think I got it and go and just get destroyed in the interview. So moral of my story is, I would study for like a week. I think you need to be practicing these whiteboard problems, data structures and algorithms for, for months, not weeks. Um, and I know that probably seems excessive, but again, back to what I kind of said with the, the previous question is, if you have that confidence of I've done a thousand of these questions, you can, you can throw anything at me, I'll probably get through it pretty well. Like these interviews are a breeze. If you try to cram and study in the last couple of days leading up to it, it's a stressful, bad, and honestly embarrassing time. I've had interviews where I'm like, I'm embarrassed to be here right now. I can't believe I'd mess this up that bad. And it's because <laughs> I tried cramming for it in like the last week. So months, not weeks, is the recommendation there. Right. It's certainly true that if you don't know Floyd's cycle detection algorithm, you can't make it up on the spot unless you're a mathematical genius. Um, same for quick sort or insertion sort. These are hard things to do. You can't just do them on the hoof on the fly or the night before. It takes work, takes planning, takes experience, takes practical application. And then you don't memorize them necessarily. They're sort of somewhere in your soul eventually, like how a, how a quick sort works or even how a bubble sort works. You can describe to somebody else just because you can, because it's really baked into you. You can't really cram that in at the last minute. So let's go on to the next question here. Um, if we have a uh, tricky question comes in, a question where you're thinking, well, um, that's a, a question that is very, very hard or trying to catch me out or one of those hideous uh, philosophical kind of questions, you know, where, oh, there's two people in a room and one always tells the truth and one always tells lies and da 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 And you got to try and figure out an answer here. Forgetting the actual specific questions, what's your advice to handle those kind of tricky questions that kind of come at you? Uh, so again, I <clears throat> I don't know if I'm the right person to give advice because every time they've come at me, it's been it's been rough. I can give a give an example of a a question here that kind of like blew my mind um, at the time was uh, I won't say the company. It was a very it was a very large company, um, <laughs> but uh, it was you know you have an infinite chessboard, you have a knight, you know a knight can only move in an L uh, shape. Uh, you know, from you, you pass in point A, you pass in point B, 
figure out the the smallest number of moves to get from point A to point B. Again, not on a limited chessboard, on an infinite chessboard. Um, and I was like, uh, what? So I was like deer in the headlights. Like, I, uh, I don't even know like where to start. This is one of those embarrassing times, uh, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, these white boy question, whiteboard questions have, uh, been the, the, what do you call it? My Achilles heel, if you will. They've always, always tripped me up. And it's cause I, you know, I don't have the CS background and I, I didn't put in the proper time to learn and study. Like I mentioned in, in the previous questions, I always tried to cram it in last minute. Cause that's how I've done every academic thing in my life. And, uh, not the way to do it in this case. So more broadly, a question here from Austin Conlon says, uh, what would you say is the value or role of whiteboard interviews, if any? Is there a value to them? I mean, you want to talk about debates, right? <laughs> I mean, this, is, uh, this is probably one of the biggest debates out there. I tend to fall on, and this is obviously through my lens. So of course, I'm going to tend to fall on the side of, I don't think there's much value in them. Um, you know, there's plenty of studies and obviously Google, Apple, all these big companies do it that way. So there's, there's some reason, and they'll even admit, by the way, they have a lot of false negatives. They'll say like, we've turned down so many great programmers due to this stuff. And they've just made the choice that we're okay with false negatives. Um, so don't, and, and when I did the, the Google interview and got turned away, they said like, oh, don't worry, this is your first time. It usually takes people four or five times like to get into Google. Like that's not uncommon. Um, but anyway, I, through my lens, I don't think they're useful, but uh, I'm not going to act like that's like the definitive answer. So there's a statement here from um, Diliana Yankova who says, uh, don't forget to provide all candidates feedback. Do you get that much? Do you get like good feedback about your take-home tests or your interviews? Do they provide details to you about what you were weak on, what you were strong on? Or is it more sort of gut instinct, wow, I really sucked at that question? No, I mean, some do, some don't. Um, and I did my best for our take on project at Aluna to make sure I, I talked to like all the candidates because I know what it feels like to put work into something or an interview and you just get the, sorry, we're, we're going to go in another direction email with no feedback at all. Um, so some companies do give you feedback, some don't. And the reason some don't, um, I, I, I can't justify this. I don't know, but they say there's like legal reasons. I don't know. Sometimes they give too much information and then a candidate, uh, that's what they say. I'm sure they've had a bad experience in the past, but, uh, um, but yeah, I, I like to give the, the candidates feedback just to help them out because I know what it's like to get rejected and it sucks. Cause oftentimes people are applying to 50 companies getting rejected by 45 of them, you know? So it's, it's tough getting those just blanket, you know, rejection emails. So I try to let them know what they can improve, right? Cause just have some empathy. Yeah, that's true. What would you say are the most common kinds of questions that get asked around swift or frame questions what are the most common questions you see again and again and again yes i mean there's there's definitely some questions you're almost 100 percent gonna get um arc automatic reference counting you know how to fix the retain cycle the whole weak cell thing if, if you don't know that and you're going into an ios interview like you're <laughs> that's probably not a good idea like you're that's probably the number one thing i would recommend you not only just again regurgitate the buzzwords but actually you know put it into practice and and do some print statements in your dnit so you can see when you know it's not there anymore um but uh well quick disclaimer too these are for like uh, i guess junior positions right you're trying to get that first job or, mm. or you know because the more senior you get, the more nuanced the interview becomes. And it's kind of hard to give blanket advice for senior positions. But for junior positions trying to get that first job, uh, communication patterns is another big one. Again, the whole like delegate one to one uh, notifications observers, one to many, all that stuff. Um, people talk about KVO, but that's I've never used KVO. And that's kind of like a, a relic of the past from what I understand. But I've never really been asked about uh, KVO. It's been just those two. Typical reference type versus value types, right? Uh, you know, classes versus struct, why they're different. Uh, <clears throat> if it's Swift specific, you're going to get the optionals questions and they're going to ask, you know, tell me all the ways you can unwrap optionals and like when you would e use each one. And then finally, uh, like basic threading is another very, very common one. And, and when I say basic, I'm not saying you need to know the details of, of all this multi-threaded code, but just knowing that like UI needs to be on the main thread and you need to and know how to like bounce back and forth between the UI and, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm sorry, the main thread and the background thread for beginner positions. Like, you know, of course, if you know more, that's great. But if you don't know the whole UI on the main thread thing, that's going to be a, it's going to be a knock against you. It really is. Yeah. Another question here from Franklin Biaruhanga, who says, is it right to interview the interviewers? If yes, what questions do you ask them? This is one of those sort of like a, uh, final closing things interviews normally end yeah, yeah. with they say oh so do you have any questions for us 
what would you recommend people ask at that point? <laughs> and it's always hilarious too. I got to give like the typical situation when this happens, it, it always happens. If you're doing like a, a Skype, you know, coding thing, or if you're doing the whiteboard, usually you take like all the time. So you'll be like one minute over your time. You're like, oh, you know, I got to stop you there. We're out of time. Uh, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> and like, you're already like three minutes over. So it's like, you know, you're not going to have like a conversation, which sucks because uh, anyway, that's usually how it goes. But uh, the, the first piece of advice is to just be genuine. Like it's very obvious when, you know, they say, what questions do you have for me? And that candidate is just reading some random question they found on the internet that they were supposed to ask. Like, that's very obvious. Like, you can read, like, you don't care about that. Like, come on. So that would be my first thing is ask genuine questions that you really want to know. And typical stuff that I want to know is I want to know, like, what my working environment is going to be like. Is it Swift? Is it Objective-C? Is it all storyboard? Is it code? Are you using MVC or MVV? Like, what architecture are you using? Uh, what's your philosophy on third-party libraries, uh, object-oriented, reactive, functional? Like, I want to know what I'm going to be working in. So I would definitely ask all those questions. And then I start asking about the team. You know, what is the workflow uh, to get new code in? Like, you know, of course, usually there's, you know, PR reviews. But, you know, what is the actual flow? How does that go down? Uh, what are the uh, dynamics of the team? You know, is it is everybody a senior developer and you're the only junior developer or is there a nice mm. mix or is it mostly junior and one senior? Like I, I like to know those dynamics. Um, also, like I mentioned earlier, this is personal to me because I I'm more interested in creating the products than I am the code, so to speak. So I want to know how much influence I'm going to have on the product. Um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, companies, if you're big enough, you know, you got product managers, designers, all the programmer does is type in the code and, and create what they already got. I like to have influence on the product. So I, I want to know if that's a thing. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, I'm just really trying to get a feel for the, uh, the environment I'm going to be working at. And then, like I said, just be genuine. Don't ask blanket questions that you're like supposed to ask, right? Cause they can see right through that. Yes. Well, you mentioned you'd like to work on products and, you know, is it programmatic versus storyboards or in your case, Objective-C and Swift as well, for, which would scare you, I'm sure, at that point in the interview, but let's put this on one side. But there's a question here, an interesting one um, from Jordan Young, who asks, uh, what are your favorite slash most fun things to work on? So what if they come back with, you know, A, B and C when you, in response to your question, you're like, yes, it sounds brilliant. I can't wait to start this company. Yeah. So um, obviously Swift over Objective-C. <laughs> um, <laughs> I... We've, we've gone down that road. Um, yeah. As far as storyboard code, I don't really care. Um, I can do both. Uh, like I said, my, my uh, products are usually a mix of both. But um, architecture is MVC uh, for sure. Uh, I don't know. Just because I feel like I don't, I don't know if we want to go down this whole road. But I, I feel like MVC is going to solve your problem 90% of the time. You know, those architectures are, are fine. I'm sure they have their place. But I think, I think in our our world, people try to shove those architectures into places like MVC is just fine. Um, so definitely MVC there. But uh, yeah, and, and like I said, anything where I am touching and influencing the consumer, like what the consumer is going to touch and experience at the end of the day on the app. Um, like I said, I like having maybe not full influence over it, but at least input on it, you know, that I can uh, affect the outcome of the app. The shoving things in there is is extraordinary right now because we've made this big leap from UI kit to Swift UI. And it means most folks at this point are developers who've done Swift who are coming from UI kit. Yes, some of you come to Swift UI first, but the majority are coming from UI kit. And they're in this UI kit mindset and they want to use MVC, they want to use coordinators, they want to use all these patterns that work great, delegates and so forth, now in Swift UI. And they want to know how it's done. And I'm like, well, you could try and squeeze coordinates in there. You could try and squeeze other things in there, MVVM, whatever you want to pick from UIKit into SwiftUI. But don't assume what worked great in UIKit is going to work <laughs> great in SwiftUI. It's a wholly new way of building things. It might fit great in there, but it might also be, you know, square peg, round hole territory. Yeah, that's why I said I feel like an absolute beginner with SwiftUI, which I'm excited about. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is um, fun. <laughs> but it, it does feel like a whole clean slate. And like you said, we're, as a community, we're still trying to figure out all the all these best practices and the best ways to use it. So uh, another reason why I think you should learn UI kit over SwiftUI right now is because, like I said, we're still trying to figure it out. It's not it's not fully formed yet. I think my approach to finding SwiftUI best practices is basically going through 20 bad practices <laughs> and figure, yeah. yeah of all these this one fits really really well but it takes yeah. a long time to get to that mm -hmm. point for sure um when you got asked a question that you just don't know you've got you just can't answer like give you know what's your experience with, with, with core haptics or something like that right i don't know something you just, you just don't know 
What's your approach to handling that kind of question? I mean, I'm just I'm just straight up honest with them. I'll be like, I don't know. I've never touched that. Uh, and I do feel like honesty is the best way to go because, again, you're not going to trick these interviewers. They've done hundreds of interviewers. They're going to be able to tell when you're, you're blowing smoke, <laughs> right? Like, you're, you're not going to trick them, right? They're, uh, so I'm just straight up honest. And I don't just say I don't know. Like, I, I try to provide, like, what I would do to fix that problem. Like, we talked about earlier in the conversation, like, plugging your holes as, as a developer. Like, I would say, okay, for example, if somebody asked me testing, I'd be like, I, you know what? Throughout my career, I just haven't had experience in testing. And I would kind of justify, if you will, why. And then I'd say, but, you know, I do recognize that's a place I need to improve. Here's what I would do to improve it. I would study this. I would, you know, build some practice projects. I would lay out the path of how I would fix that problem, um, if I didn't know uh, the, the answer at the time. Yeah. I think honestly, an answer folks should just keep in their back pocket is, I don't know, but I'd love to find out more. Mm -hmm. Because that's yeah. that's the essence of programming. I mean, there are of all Apple's APIs, and I've touched so many of them, I maybe know one in 10, maybe, I don't know, mm -hmm. right? But I would love to know more. I mean, I'm, I'm totally psyched to try things out in Vision or Core ML or Create ML or, you know, drag and drop Swift UI. Whatever is the cool new thing, I want to poke it. I want to press it. I want to try it out and have fun with it and enjoy it. And showing that tenacity to learn, that keenness, mm -hmm. I still want to keep pushing it. I still want to keep on breaking things and fixing them and then breaking them again and refixing them again. That never gets old. No matter what framework you're using, what language you're using, what platform you are, what company you're applying for, I am keen to learn and push and try is a skill that never gets old, quite frankly, is it? Yeah, yeah. And like you kind of just illustrated, like as long if even better than saying, I don't know, here's how I would fix it. If you have an example of here's how I fixed it in the past, you know, like I didn't know Sprite Kit in the past. I so I went ahead and built this game and then talk about that. So giving a specific example of how you fix the problem to show that you've done it before. Because like you said, at the end of the day, we're never going to know every single framework. But if you've proven that you can pick up a framework and learn it, uh, you can pretty much learn any of them. It's true. And a statement here from Yo Lev, I think is quite interesting. Um, you could say to the interviewer, show me your code before I start working for you. Have you ever tried that? Would, would you dare try that? Uh, it depends on how much leverage I felt I had. <laughs> <laughs> That's a negotiation tactic, right? Like if you feel like they really want you, and, you know, because sometimes that is the case, right? They, they like you. They really want you. Now you have the leverage. Other times you have like no leverage. So I guess it would depend on uh, on that key factor there. But it, it is very, very valuable uh, if you can see their code base before. Yes. So that's a question here from Lucas A who says, uh, do you think that as a young developer, I should focus on testing? Going back to this sore point for you again. What's yeah. your advice to a young a young developer? Where should they go first? Well, it, uh, I guess it all depends on where you're at. Um, again, take this with a grain of salt. This is just how I feel. If you're still learning like the basics of Swift and learning how to build an app, I don't think you should put testing in that in that pot. Um, I think you should get those basics sorted out. You know, you have a full understanding of it. Again, back to what I talked about is I think people move on from topic to topic way too fast. I don't think they spend enough time drilling the fundamentals, fully learning it. I think they they build one or two table views. All right, cool, I know table views, I'm out. You know, uh, So and I think that might be the case of what he's talking about here. Uh, if Again, based on what he said, a young, you know, up and coming developer, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not discounting testing, I'm not saying it's not important, but mm -hmm. I think you gotta learn, you know, learn the basics first. And then again, back to your learning evolves over time, evolve into testing. There's a question here from Robert Ramirez. What are some red flags about the environment or company that you should look out for during an interview? Things you say, this this doesn't feel right here. Uh, my number one thing is arrogance. Um, and we all kind of like deal with that here in, in, in programming. You know, some developers just think they're, uh, you know, they, they're, I don't know, I'm trying to say this in a nice way without like cursing and all that stuff. But <laughs> Um, you know, you know, the developers I'm talking about, they just think they're, they're better than everyone. Their way of doing things is right. And if, you know, it's an environment like that, like, uh, I don't, I don't want like any part of it. Um, my, my thing is, so if the, if the technology lines up with like what I said, like, uh, we talked about earlier, the architecture and all that stuff, and it doesn't necessarily have to be what I prefer working in. Like, it, you know, I haven't done functional, but if I really want to learn functional and I like the team and I like the product, yeah, that's not a deal breaker at all. Um, but uh, I would say it's more personalities than actual technologies. Um, I, I've always say this, you, these per people you work with, you spend more time with them than you do your family. Like you're there eight, 10 hours a day. If you don't like them, 
uh, and I don't want to make it sound like it's a popularity contest, but that does have to play a huge factor. So mine are all personality based. So if someone's speaking to you and they're doing all the talking or not listening to your answers or ignoring you or what are you thinking? Like, because it's hard well, to tell, isn't it, interview? Because you haven't got a lot of time with them. Well, no, I mean, I can tell, and this happened at, I mean, I've already already said how bad my Google experience was. This happened with Google. Like, I walked in, and they didn't ask any questions about me. They're like, all right, right. You could tell the interview, you could tell that I was, like, interrupting their day, and they didn't want to be there. Like, that that was the vibe I got, you know what I mean? Oh. They, like, <clears throat> didn't ask about me or why I wanted to work there or get to know me. They're like, all right, uh, here's the problem. Uh, we're going to do this. Go ahead and do it up on the whiteboard. Then we would talk through it, and they're like, all right, cool, and they, they would leave. Like, you could tell it was just... I was interview number 783 for them and they didn't care at all, you know? Um, so that, again, after that Google interview, I was like, I don't even want to work for these big companies. And that's what <laughs> led me to go indie. But, uh, so yes, they're just, it's almost like dismissive. Yeah. Um, and, and you can almost, I don't want to, I almost don't want to blame them. Cause like I said, they probably do three interviews a day. Uh, it does take away from their work. Like I kind of get where they're coming from and they may not be interviewing for their specific team, so they could care less. So like, I kind of understand it, but I just don't think, uh, it just doesn't, didn't give me a good impression. Like I said, it completely drove me away from even thinking about going there. Dismissive surely is one of the worst things you want to see in an interview. I mean, if they don't want to be there, that's, that's just bad. We've got a question here from Mustafa Khalil who asks, uh, good afternoon. Hope you're all good. Would contributing to a big open source project make your resume, your CV, pop out, stand out compared to others? I believe so. I mean, I, I don't have any personal experience in this, so I can't vouch for it firsthand, but um, I would believe so. Like if I was, you know, trying to interview a candidate and bring them onto the team and I saw they have uh, some, you know, significant contributions, not not just fixing a typo in the readme, or right? they have some significant contributions to a, a well-known large project. Yeah, that would be very impressive. Uh, the question here from Yuri Samelyuk. Uh, it's something you touched on briefly. He says, Sean, which model do you prefer, MVC or MVVM? Yeah, so it's it's MVC. Um, so one of the, uh, let me disclaimer too, because I found MVC like works 90% of the time, I haven't really explored others uh, besides like a basic tutorial. Mm. You know what I mean? So take this opinion with a grain of salt because I don't have full-blown experience in MVVM. And from what I understand and know, MVVM makes your, your code more easy to test, which we've talked about. <laughs> I haven't gone down that that road either. So uh, the question of that is uh, MVC. Again, like I said, I, I feel like that's going to work 90% of the time. Most of the time you're using Viper, MVP, whatever. I feel like you're just shoving that in there when it's unnecessary. I can, and I let me go agree. on this rant real quick. <laughs> go Sorry. Ahead. I, when, you, when you get, because MVC is like the, the norm, right? That's what most developers are going to know. I believe when you try to be clever and throw in this random architecture, you're also making it hard on new people coming into your team, right? So you're, you're just, I don't know. I think you're trying to be clever for the sake of being clever for the most part. <laughs> like you got to give that disclaimer. Uh, there's absolutely times when those, uh, things are necessary, but again, I think MVC is the vast majority of the time going to be perfectly fine and make your life easier as a team. Yes. M MVC for me is not 90%. It's 100% of the time. It will solve the problem perfectly fine in UIKit land. I'd happily work in a project with MVVM. Get that. Cool. I would not work in a project using Viper. I would not work in a project using clean code. If they were using that, I would say, thanks for the interview, folks. See you. <laughs> uh, you know, the I'm, I'm, I'm leaving because at that point, you're, uh, you're, you're wasting time with being an architecture astronaut, quite frankly. You're not focused on shipping good code. You're, ship you're focusing on shipping architectural niceties, and that has no interest to me. MVC yeah, does yeah. a fantastic job when implemented correctly and well and in small chunks, not like just huge, massive view controllers, but break them out of the view controller. That works brilliant in MVC. There's no need to go much further. If you want MVVM, fine, I get that. It's a very nice architecture for testing, as you say, not least. But Viper, I just don't see the point, quite frankly. And clean code can do one, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a question here, uh, which is from Gaetano Senegalia, I say. Um, I apologize for your name incorrectly. What is a senior developer? Do you feel like a senior developer? After 20 years, it's still difficult for me to see myself as an elder. Things are always changing, and there's always something new. Yeah, uh, I, 
that's what I always say is like, you ask somebody what a senior developer is, you ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers. So I, I agree with you. Like, I don't even consider, uh, I, I guess I don't consider myself junior, but as far as like mid-level senior, like uh, it's all such a blur to me. Like, I don't, I don't know or care to be honest with you. Um, but, uh, so yeah, what is a senior developer? I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's a very, very hard answer. And it doesn't sound like you're worried about that. If you've been doing this 20 years, you're not worried about it, <laughs> but I do know there are junior developers or, or mid-level developers that care a lot about it. Um, and I'm not sure why, maybe it's because of a title that you can get at a company for a certain level of pay. I don't know. But, uh, I just think a lot of people put a lot of thought, effort, and stress into whether they're a mid-level or a senior. I just think it's irrelevant. I, I, I can understand it. Folks, want to see the word junior erased from their title sure they don't yeah. want it on there of course they don't i i, I get the junior thing it's the whole like mid-level senior and then like i don't even know the details of this right but once you get into like big companies there's like l2 l3 there's like a whole system exactly of, like, that, that, that makes know. sense because if you think about it you, you'll see some people who are 24 years old and are senior developers okay if you're senior now what are you in 40 years time when you're still working <laughs> you <laughs> right. know, if you retire at 65 or so when you're when you're in your 50s 60s what are you then senior 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 well no there's a you gotta break it down more than that yeah. certainly in my head i divide it not into what code you necessarily can write but what kind of problems you're tackling uh, a junior developer i would expect would be someone i would sit down with and say okay your task today is to do this screen here here's the design and then ask them how they think they might solve it and then bounce ideas back with them for a while and then say, oh, well, this might be this. What about this? Just to help them work through the problem and come to their own conclusions about the best way to solve it, which is, of course, hopefully the best way to solve it, but finding mm -hmm. their own way. An intermediate developer, a mid-level one, will be someone who won't have to do that, but is still tackling regular kinds of problems. But they'll do it on their own. And your senior developer, for me, is the kind of person who'll have half an eye on the code, but half an eye on other business concerns. What are the commercials behind this? How can I take the team forward? How can I mentor other people? How can I organize training? You know, and, and that kind of thing, you know, deadlines, I wouldn't want to inflict on a junior developer. They are, in my eyes, certainly I was when I was a junior developer, a, a code monkey. Sit down, write the code you're given, do these tasks. And as you progress, you get more responsibility, more understanding, more awareness, more uh, responsibility, more trust in the team to take on bigger tasks. But you're still writing code if you're intermediate or junior and even senior you're still writing the same sorts of code but the responsibility behind it is what evolves over time mm -hmm. there's a question here from jensen john um does an ios developer need to know all the git commands or can you use a ui tool such as source tree i use the i use the github gui like and here's why because like if you I mean, you, we all know, right? 98% of the time you're doing git pull, git push. <laughs> like, I mean, and the GUI for me is like way faster to just like do that. So, uh, you know, it's very, very rare that I have to do any like, so rare that I don't even know the name, like rebase or whatever, um, that like I'll just probably end up having to follow a tutorial and then I'll bust out the command line. But for my day-to-day -day work, because it's basically, okay, git pull, git push, uh, done, then yeah, I, I use a GUI. So I guess the answer to the question is, do you have to know all the commands? Um, I don't think so, because I, I don't. <laughs> and uh, I guess if you if you take good caution in like not having to completely like, you know, revert back to a specific commit or the whole rebase, uh, yeah, you'll probably save yourself some time. Yes, uh, I have a real problem with Git. I mean, my brain is not wired well in this respect. And I haven't actually said this publicly before. I can only use the command line. Mm. And I've, you know, a tower email, we say, hey, Paul, we love your stuff. Have a free tower license. I was like, thank you very much. I launch it and go, whoo, I don't get this tool. <laughs> this is way above my pay grade. I don't understand it at all. Yeah. Go to the command line, you know, git branch, git checkout, git tag. <laughs> I can do all that from the command line. I just really, mm. really struggle translating that into a GUI. I'm quite... Uh, set in my ways i'm only i'm only 40 years old sean <laughs> I, <laughs> I feel like i'm set in my ways like i'm never changing from this ever again it's a, it's a funny story that how like you can be influenced early because like i i learned on the command line i was a command line person from the start i was like i oh, don't know and then my first job they all used the the github gui and i fought it and fought it for like months and then finally i was like all right i'll give it a try 
haven't looked back since. So <laughs> it's interesting. Um, but what I like about the GUI too is like when I have my commit, it shows all the files changes and I can just click from file to file to file and see those changes. And if I want to like discard all changes on just that file, I can just like right click discard changes rather than like navigating to it on the command line and, you know, deleting it from there. I'm sure once you get good at it, it's fast, but I find the GUI to just be really, really fast and easy for the day-to-day -day needs. You know, when you have to do anything tricky, it's probably not great, but again, 98% of the time, it's great. Well, listen, Sean, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for taking all our questions. Where can folks find you on the internet? Uh, yeah, youtube.com slash Sean Allen. Uh, Twitter is at Sean Allen underscore dev. Uh, if you're interested in uh, some iOS coursework, I have a absolute beginner course. Like this course was designed to be like, hey, you got a friend that's interested in iOS development? Cool, give them that. Like mm. we start from the very basics. And then also we talked about take-home courses a lot. Uh, I have a project that is recreating a take-home test uh, that is, uh, aimed at people that are, you know, they've been learning Swift for a while now and they're, tr they're trying to transition into getting that very first job. So that's what that is designed for. Again, seanallen.teachable.com. Uh, and I just re, uh, we're plugging everything. And I just, uh, started redoing my website and publish Johnson Dell's, uh, framework. Uh, so you can check that out at seanallen.co. I have the basics up there, but that will be evolving over time. If you want to see how that, that grows. Awesome. Uh, once again, thanks for everyone for coming. Thanks to Revenue Cap for sponsoring these events. Uh, they make it super easy to add in-app purchases to your apps. Now you're thinking, oh, in-app purchases, let's just stalk it. It's not. I've done in-app purchases. I've done tens of millions of dollars of subscriptions. And it's really, really hard because subs are not handled very well by Apple. You are supported over all these different devices. Every, every iPad and iPhone user owns has to share a single subscription. It's really, really hard to do well. And quite frankly, it's not what we care about. We care about making great apps. So if you want to build great apps and not worry about receipt validation, user churn, subscriptions, all that horror, talk to Revenue Cat. They've got $10,000 a month revenue limit on their free plan. It's, it's a no-brainer. It's absolutely brilliant. Check out Revenue Cat. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the channel, please do. I appreciate it very much. It's a podcast as well on Apple Podcasts, swiftly speaking. Go check that out. Otherwise, folks, once again, thanks to Sean. Thanks to folks asking questions. I will see you all next time. Take care, folks. Bye. See you, everybody.